So again, to the audience members, thank you for your engagement. My name is Shirley Torho, and I'm functioning as the MC at this stage. We are currently on stage two for asynchronous APIs. And so our wonderful speakers are coming to the stage shortly. Um, I will just take a moment to introduce them. We have two speakers. The first one is Vikas Anand, who is a PM for Google Cloud at Platform Google Cloud. And our second speaker in this segment is Greg Braille, who is a principal software engineer at Google Cloud. And so together, they will be talking about drawing parallels between APIs and event streams. And so to our wonderful speakers, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Shirley. Hopefully, uh, you can see us and hear us. Yes, you look great. We're ready when you are. Great. Awesome. Yeah, we are, we are really excited to be here uh, speaking to you live from uh, you know a Google office in California. Uh, my name is Vikas Anand. I head uh, you know product for Apigee, uh, and of course, Greg. Hi, I'm Greg Braille. I've been working on APIs and API management for uh, for Google Cloud, and before that, for Apigee for a very long time. And uh, you know we choose this uh, we chose this uh, this location uh, deliberately. That's actually a real tree behind us. Yeah, this is a real tree. It's true. Yes. So we're between one fern. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and uh, of course, there are galactic uh, events happening behind us uh, since we are on the topic of events. Um, so uh, you know, our topic is really about events today and how events are proliferating. Uh, what I would like to start by saying is, if there are two takeaways from from our session for you. Uh, one is, uh, you know, events are mainstream. Second is because they become mainstream and there's a significant proliferation, they need to be managed. We come from an API management background and we know how to manage APIs. Uh, APIs are not just uh, the tip of the spear to drive, to help our customers and you, uh, our users drive digital transformation. Uh, but today, uh, as we pivot towards the uh, next generation of API-based applications and products, uh, I think it's very important to focus on things like digital excellence and APIs are at the core of it. So uh, we understand that space. Apigee has been a market leader. Let's talk to you more about events now. So before we talk about events, just, just set the stage up a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of things which have happened in the last year. Uh, I know... Greg and I have uh, had an opportunity to come together today and talk to you. I know many of you uh, are, are, are don't have this access yet. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, you know, uh, we we, uh, uh, we obviously hope things get better all over, and we can all be talking to each other in person. Uh, but because of the pandemic, there have been some significant trends which actually started before the pandemic, and they only got accelerated through this last year. Uh, number one. If you look at the segments like retail, there's been a clear pivot towards online shopping. Uh, and this has really accelerated the adoption of digital channels, whether you're shopping through uh, your uh, you know, phone, your, your mobile devices, your desktop. Uh, there's also integration coming into uh, devices which you use in your ecosystem. As an example, in, in, in the car, uh, now on the uh, uh, the applications that are available through a screen, uh, you can actually order a coffee, uh, uh, your favorite coffee, while you're driving up. Only um, in Tesla's, probably. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, it's coming through. It's coming through. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, since we could not go and visit, uh, you know, our our, our healthcare providers last year, and uh, they were focused on really helping, you know, through this pandemic, uh, telehealth really replaced. Uh, uh, the concept of meeting physically for the sundry and, uh, you know, the regular appointments. And that's where there has been a lot of growth. Uh, and of course, uh, there has been a significant increase in usage of digital currency, digital payments, uh, versus the actual physical cash. Uh, and that's a key trend that we see. So uh, all of this is really requiring a lot of innovation uh, when it comes to delivering these solutions from an infrastructure solution and application perspective. And that's proliferated the usage of APIs. And of course, it ties back to the actual proliferation of events as well. So if you look at events, uh, and Greg will go through uh, the definition of an event in a few minutes, uh, but I'll talk about it in the context of uh, you know, industry and how it touches us every day. Uh, 
regardless of the vertical, I mean, uh, we've got a few here, but there are more than these. Uh, they are touching us in our lives every day. Uh, mobile payments, internet banking, embedded finance. Uh, there's a lot of transactions which get triggered. If I am transferring money from my account to Greg's account, uh, or, or if I'm paying my bills, uh, there's actually a, a number of transactions getting triggered, which also trigger a bunch of events, right? And events need to be handled. Uh, in healthcare, uh, you know, there are a number of IoT devices, uh, wearables uh, as we have, and wireless devices, uh, which really generate a lot of events uh, which need to be monitored. Uh, today, we, you know, we get the information about how many steps we are doing using our phone uh, into our apps as well. Uh, telecommunication, uh, telecom, I mean, real-time recommendations and solutions uh, which are offered to consumers based on geolocation uh, or, you know, in, you know, use cases where the, the, the actual consumer is touched through the different ecosystem or technology they're using, like a connected car, uh, are also delivering these experiences through events. Uh, retail and commerce, of course, billions of events get generated. This is a tremendous space. I mean, uh, we, we talked about this last year. Uh, our Black Friday, Cyber Monday, we supported a very large number of customers uh, you know, through uh, their life cycle of uh, supporting their own customers through Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Uh, traffic close to 3 trillion API calls during that period. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, a lot of this is generating backend events. So right. the volume is going off, uh, going, uh, you know, is growing. Number of event types are growing. And of course, they are touching uh, a lot of uh, use cases, including becoming more mission critical. So where do they help? Just to summarize, they help to quickly react to user actions, uh, provide a, you know, digital engagement through the different channels, and of course, help deliver personalized, uh, highly personalized experiences. So with that said, let's segue into the next part. And this is where I'm going to ask Greg to really tell us a little bit more about actual event definition, event stream, and uh, of course, some of the core concepts where we need to provide management capabilities. Of course, of course. And yeah, interestingly, you know, before I, I was working on APIs and Apogee, um, I worked on messaging systems and event-driven systems, um, including WebLogic JMS and some failed startups and IBM things and all kinds of things. So it's very interesting to start to see these worlds come together where we're starting to realize there are really parallels here, right? Um, so yeah, an event stream, hey, you know, it's a stream of messages that represent, an, that represent events, right? I think a lot of times when people talk about event streams in the enterprise today, nowadays they think about systems like Kafka, where it's it's extremely good at, at pushing out a huge volume of events in a highly reliable way to a lot of consumers. So the cases that Vikas was talking about, you know, retail, whenever we do a sale, whenever inventory changes, um, generate an event, and that can then be consumed in a lot of different ways. And, and these event streams have a lot of advantages, but one of the big advantages is that they make it possible to decouple, to decouple the production and consumption. So that, for instance, rather than every system that produces an event, a you know new sale event or a new customer event, having to understand all the places where that event could go, um, by deploying event streaming systems, the enterprise has the flexibility to say the contract is when there's a new event, we publish an event, and then when we, as we build new systems and adapt our business, we can then consume these event streams in different ways. Um, event streams are, of course, not terribly new. Um, you know, the publish and subscribe paradigm became very popular in the financial services industry back in the 90s, and that's how every trading floor was implemented. And then when Wall Street went online, that's how every, you know, online brokerage that you're all probably spending too much time day trading on, you know, be careful, I've seen this go badly in the past, um, you know, is, is based on that technology as well. So... You know, these are sort of some examples, right? And it's interestingly that we have systems today like Kafka that allow you to do things like go back and see the stock price. But the really even fun, more fun things are the things you can build on top of it, like some of these continuous query systems that right. will say, you know, based on this streaming, a stream of event continuously compute the average or the, you know, the, the trailing average or standard deviation or the, or the slope or whatever. And Greg, this one is actually API, it is New York. So we're talking yes. to a lot of folks who, yes, are, who know a lot more about this than we do. I've been doing it, been doing it a lot. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, hey, what's the difference? And, and I think it's important we have this background before we talk about some of the parallels. Um, APIs, you can certainly do synchronous, do asynchronous things with APIs. But when we talk about APIs, it's a request response paradigm. When we talk about event streams, and again, over the years, people have figured out ways to do it, request response messaging using events. But generally speaking, the paradigm that makes the most sense to most engineers is to keep those API synchronous. You send something, you expect a response back in some reasonable number of milliseconds or an event stream where you publish. Um, we all, because this is an API conference, we know and love HTTP, we debate the REST paradigm and what those four letters mean all the time. We're talking increasingly about gRPC and GraphQL. In the event stream world, uh, there are some standard protocols like AMQP, MQTT, and a little bit older protocol Stomp. Um, and then there are many, like for instance, JMS, which is the Java Message Service API, is probably the most common API in that space. And that's a Java API, not an HTTP API. Um, and event streams do often have a subscription model. Um, and that's, you know, we've done over the years various combinations of publish, subscribe, and, and message queuing. But I think what I see nowadays is it's all kind of merging into one event stream paradigm where you put events on a stream and you can consume them in different ways, persistently, non-persistently, so on and so forth. So this is kind of the part where I think there's some interesting, some interesting synergy here. Um, when we talk about APIs, right, we have as part of sort of, you know, being part of the API management world for so long, um, the industry has gone from APIs being something people didn't really understand to APIs being something that everybody wanted to have to layer on top of their existing systems to now, you know, entire enterprises are built around hundreds or thousands of APIs. API management began sort of with external consumption, with people saying, I want to have a public API just like Flickr does. So we need to be able to do quotas and rate limits and authentication using OAuth, for instance. In order to have a public API, we need a developer portal. And this is the part of API management that everyone seems to understand and want to talk about, which is, oh, API management is having a developer portal so I can have api.mycompany.com. But actually, the vast majority of API management happens inside the enterprise when companies have those thousands of APIs and they need a way for developers to discover what APIs are available for the API producers to be able to control who's going to use their APIs and ideally to move this all in a self-service direction. So we have taken APIs from sort of the SOA world where it was 10 years ago, which is, hey, I have a service that does this interesting thing. If you're in another part of my company and want to build a business based on my service, come to my meeting. I'll email you a Microsoft Word document. You can go through it and then we'll have a bunch more meetings and you'll call my service to the API world where a team can say, we have a corporate API portal, the APIs all follow a consistent design pattern, the APIs are all authenticated in a consistent way that meets our security standards. Via self-service, you can now use that API in your product. You may need to speak to us before you go into production, but you can get started right away. And we have, we have a lot of APIs like this within Google. Some of them are gRPC APIs, some of them are Stubby APIs, some of them are HTTP APIs, but large companies do a lot of this. And I think where we are with event streams is it's time to sort of make that same pattern work. Exactly. There are definitely companies that have hundreds or thousands of event streams in a variety of technologies. They have MQQs, they have JMS systems, they have Kafka, they have MQP. I think, you know, the point here, which is becoming very clear is, uh, you know, innovate, technologies which help drive innovation are driven or delivered through APIs, right? Right. And, and you build API products. And behind the scenes, a number of these backend systems or interfaces are coming through events. Yeah. So as you pointed out, there's not right. just proliferation, but multiple events you know, streams right. behind, which need to start to be managed now. So when you speak to a CIO and they, you know, today, you know, they will often think, oh, I have no idea how many APIs I have, which ones are being used, how much they're being used, which ones I can turn off and which ones are so critical to my system, I had better pay more attention to them. But an API management solution can help you get a hold of that. I think the event world is in the same place. You have hundreds or thousands of event streams on five or six different technologies in your company, which are the ones that are critical, which are the ones that are meeting the SLA. 
So if we look at, you know, just like we do with APIs, producers and consumers, consumers. I think the same, we're going to start going through the same pattern for event streams. The producer of an event stream wants to turn that event stream into a product. And they may, they will probably initially want to share that product internally, but ideally via self-service or some amount of self-service. So it doesn't become a meeting on a Microsoft Word doc whenever you want to actually use an event stream, but it becomes a web page and something via self-service. Then you want to know how much is it being used? How is it being analyzed? And then you may want to start to have that event stream be consumed outside the boundaries of your enterprise, perhaps by a business partner. I heard the other day about, an, uh, about a, a way that the FAA is using event streams to publish events uh, on changes to, you know, notice what they call notice to airmen. Or maybe they should call them notice to air people, but that's what they call them, NOTAMs and things like that, right? Um, it would make a lot of sense to be able to say, okay, now we've done this internally. We need a little bit of extra protection externally. We need some, some better rate limiting. We need to be able to set a quota so that people will not overwhelm my event system and create a, and create a, a noisy neighbor problem by publishing too many events or consuming too many events. Perhaps I need to do a little bit of extra checking for data loss protection to make sure I'm not inadvertently publishing social security numbers on, in, you know, on events. These same things happened in APIs where we have these layers of APIs where there are internal APIs, partner APIs, public APIs. The same thing's going to happen to API providers in the event world. And on the consumer side, certainly, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if you were a business partner of a financial institution and they said, you know, you're a company like the one I work for that has so many billions of dollars I can't imagine. That's all managed in various banks. There's somebody here who needs to be able to see, hey, I need a stream of all of the payments that are coming into us and all the payments that are coming out and all the things that are happening to all of my investments. Wouldn't it be great if via self-service, you could click on a portal and see, okay, that's all published using the AMQP protocol. Here's how you get the credentials to consume that data. Here's a catalog that shows you exactly what all the events look like. And here's a way for you to monitor the consumption of your events. So I think that's, we did that for APIs. I think it's, it's high time that we all work together to do that same thing for events. And with that said, I think we're gonna switch to the other tab because I think that's all. Is there anything else we missed for cost that we should talk about? No, I think uh, we, uh, we covered most of the points. I think, um, you know, Greg and I are talking about this conceptually but you know, uh, if you look at uh, the evolution that we've seen together in the API management space, I think we see that uh, uh, as an early stage requirement for events at the moment and something which will actively evolve going forward. Um, so with that said, I think we're open to questions. Wonderful presentation, Greg and Vakis. Um, you know, I think, yeah, no, like, you know, you touched on so many wonderful points. And, you know, my first question from for you is, you know, in what instance or are there any instances in which you would want to combine event streams with APIs for a better user experience? And I think you've seen some examples of this. Yeah, so there are some really interesting examples. Uh, and some of the things that we described early on uh, uh, in the vertical presentations, let me give you a specific example. Uh, you know, if, and this is something which happened to me a few days back where I actually got uh, a fraud alert on my credit card. And typically what would happen is as a part of the events being generated, you would end up doing uh, like a, a, a call to a human somewhere, a person, and that would, you would have a conversation, then you would either dispute the transaction or then you actually make, uh, you, you know, you close a card. And that used to happen historically, right? Uh, for me, it was so easy that when this event was triggered, I was notified. And then in two or three clicks, I was able to actually request for a brand new car and say that this car has been compromised. So that's one example. The second example is, you know, and this is something which we are doing with a retail customer where we are exposing their data and inventory as an API. Uh, as uh, customers uh, are coming into the store, uh, you know, a lot of interaction of these customers happened last year through their online channels. Mm -hmm. uh, so they really want to personalize the experience when the same customer comes into their store. Uh, so what if, uh, as they are walking around based on 
uh, you know, their choices in the past, as well as uh, the data, uh, you know, uh, analytics that is available, if inventory or suggestions can be made while they're in store, right? So it's an event which is generated notifying the user on available promotions uh, while they're in store. So that's a, a pretty interesting use case where, you know, you blur the line between the online interaction mm -hmm. to the offline interaction and actually have the same customer experience consistent regardless of how you are, you know, interfacing with the retailer. Right. You want to add something? No, no, I think those are great. <laughs> And so just thinking about how you two work together, you know, what have been some of the most significant challenges on this journey um, in your work? Oh, so, you know, uh, I, I think this question about how uh, we have been working as a hybrid all yeah. of last year uh, and how we've been able to collaborate, uh, I think it's public information how Google quickly uh, had uh, moved to a hybrid work experience and work environment. Uh, you know, uh, obviously it was important for us to have all the tools to be productive, which uh, were uh, were available through uh, our, our, our Google Workspace uh, mm -hmm. set of capabilities. Uh, I'm a product manager. Greg is an architect. It's very important for us to have that experience where we can actually work together and then ideate sometimes you know in front of a whiteboard which we were you supposed to which we used to and now uh, obviously we had to switch virtual for yeah. pretty much the whole of last year but we have access to tools and yeah. we were able to have this uh, but we're really glad to be back to actually do this in person we've had some great tools and we've definitely missed some of the informal interaction yes i will say it's been interesting to watch how some of the formal interaction in some ways has gotten better i've seen cases in meetings in which sometimes you know there'd be 10 people in a meeting and you know, seven of them would be afraid to talk, but they seem <laughs> to be a little bit less afraid to talk when they're on video. Um, and everybody's just in a box. That's kind of nice. Um, so it's like we kind of need the combination of the two, right? I, I've also seen cases where because we can, we have a lot of meetings, <laughs> and we're trying to to you know keep that from getting out of control, right? Um, so you know, navigating that's been a real challenge. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be an individual contributor, so I advise a lot of people, but I don't manage thousands of people people who do would have a very challenging job right now, returning to the office and all that. Wonderful. And so my final question for you is, you know, what's next when you think about future steps, you know, particularly as this field expands, you know, what, what's next for the two of you? There are a lot of things we're thinking about in terms of APIs and API management. Um, we've done a ton with making it possible to share APIs easily. But as we saw today, I think there's a great opportunity to expand that to more natively include event streams, GraphQL APIs, gRPC style services. Um, we're also thinking more and more about how these things are governed inside enterprises that have thousands and hundreds of thousands of APIs. How can we continue to, to improve the tooling so that people can keep those things consistent? So you can say there's a consistent design pattern and a consistent security policy. And eventually all of this has to tie back to the value chain for our customers. Yeah. So we are hyper-focused on how we can enable the technology, the user experience for the developers, right from the software development lifecycle to supporting some of the developer constructs like async APIs, GraphQL, and other things yeah. which Greg described, but eventually ensure that from a digital value chain perspective brings in the success that our customers, our users, and consumers are looking for. And that's what we focused on. For sure. Well, Besides, thank you both. Oh, please continue. And building, <laughs> and building Lego, yeah. And building Lego. <laughs> no, that's important. Um, so thank you. No, thank you both for your time. Would you like to quickly share how folks can get in contact with you before you set um, get off the stage? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, we. I uh, think we tweet. Yeah, we tweet. We both have uh, tweet IDs. So I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. Uh, Vikas Anand, and uh, my Twitter is Vikas A at Google. Uh, what's your Greg? Um, I'm I think I'm G Braille on Twitter, but I might be Greg okay. Braille. I'm sorry, I don't have an other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, pretty easy to find if you look for us, and uh, you know we'll update the slides to include our tweet handles, our Twitter handles, uh, as well as our LinkedIn profiles. 
Wonderful. Well, it was great meeting you both. Thank you so much for this engaging presentation. And we look forward to, you know, continuing to, to hear about your work and your, your progress in this area. Okay, great. Good thank to, you. Good to see thank you. you. And thank you all. Thank you.